Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm very pleased to welcome you all. My name is Selina Liu, uh, Liuna in Chinese. I'm an assistant for the journal Cognitive Semantics. Uh, Innovation in Linguistics is a Zoom lecture series organized by the journal. In this series, we host internationally prominent linguists to present their innovative ideas. Today, we have the great honor to have the first series titled Time and Events in Language, Mind, and the World. It will be jointly presented by Dr. Krit Singha and Dr. Vela da Silva Singha. Dr. Krit Singha is honorary professor at the School of Politics, Philosophy, Language Communication Studies, University of East Anglia, and a visiting professor at Southwest University. Chongqing. Dr. Vela da Silva Singha is a British Academy postdoctoral research fellow at the Department of Experimental Psychology, University of Oxford. She is editor of the International Journal of Language and Culture. So at the end of this lecture, we will have a little bit Q&A. So save up your questions. You can put them in the chat or talk to our speakers directly in the Q&A. Now let's welcome our two speakers. I'll hand over the floor to you, Dr. Singha and Dr. Silva Singha. Thank you. Thank you very much, Selina. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very clearly. Good. That's fine. So uh, we'll both say hello. hello. <laughs> Hi, and uh, um, I will start. Our presentation is a joint one, uh, but uh, I will begin, okay. Uh, well, you can see the title, so we will take it from there. So I begin with uh, a quotation from a, a physicist, a very famous physicist called Carlo Rovelli. Uh, and he has written a book uh, which was published in 2018 called The Order of Time about the modern uh, science, physical and cosmological science of time. And he wrote in this book, there is a chapter which is called, the world is made of events, not things. And he says, uh, we can think of the world as made up of things, of substances, of entities, of something that is. Or we can think of it as made up of events, of happenings, of processes, of something that occurs. Uh, and this is a real ontological challenge at least to the conventional Western philosophy of time. Uh, and we hope to show uh, how, it, uh, how Rovelli's ideas uh, have some kind of uh, uh, resonance with our own. So time is our subject. Where and what is it? Is everything in the physical universe without exception located both in space and time, or which is not the same, space-time, is time everywhere the same? Does time's arrow travel at the same rate everywhere in one direction? Uh, and does the universe really have an age? And can time be said to even exist independently of somebody to experience uh, or observe events in the world? Well, we're not going to give an answer to these big questions, which uh, scientists don't even agree on, uh, but we would, would like you to bear them in mind. Now let's move to, we, we call this time in the world, in the mind and in, uh, in language. Uh, so let's think a little bit about how time is relevant to all living things and of course to uh, the human brain. Uh, life on earth is biologically adapted to the diurnal and seasonal cycles whether we're talking about plants or animals. Uh, think of reproductive cycles, cycles of migration of birds and fish and so on, hibernation of some animals in the winter, and of course, the alternation of sleep and wakefulness uh, in many animals. So human beings and other organisms are often said to have a genetically determined biological clock whose mandate cannot be ignored without detriment to health. But that raises the question, 
Is there some kind of clock which measures time in the brain? Here's an answer from two very eminent neuroscientists, okay? Uh, it would be unimaginable to perform contemporary neuroscience research without referring to spatial and temporal units. And what they mean by that is things like millimeters and seconds and milliseconds. However, declaring from such comparisons made in experiments that some brain region or mechanism represents space and time or calculates distance or duration is another matter. Studying transformation rules between brain structures does not require resorting to concepts of space or time. Okay, so the situation in science is that Carlo Rovelli has shown that the, the variable t, uh, meaning time, is not necessary for physics. And Busaki and Tingley are saying that there isn't really something called t or time in the brain either. So where is it? Okay, uh, before we go further, I want to introduce another notion. Some of you, some of you may have heard of it mental time travel, something that we can all do because we can actually think about past and future. Not only humans, but also some other higher mammals like apes and elephants appear to have episodic memories as well as learned behavioral routines and repertoires. Uh, also birds, some corvids can anticipate search at hidden food locations without being cued. Okay, they just do it independently. And some apes can not only remember episodes, like episodes of things that happened, but also use these memories in planning action sequences. And such mental time travel depends, our colleague Peter Jerdenfors from Lund University has pointed out, this depends on having what he calls detached representations, context independent, event representations. And human beings most certainly do have this. Now, nothing. Okay, so we share some kind of ability for mental time travel with other species, but nothing in the animal kingdom remotely approaches the event representation capacities of a three-year-old human child. Uh, these children can tell narratives of remembered, anticipated, or imagine, imagined event sequences, and they can use adverbs and tenses and other resources to locate events in time relative to the present. So our basic conclusion is it's event representation, the biological clock, that is key to understanding both the human language capacity and conceptualizations of time. So we asked where and what is time? Okay. Objects and, and events, right? Objects are often thought of as being located in space and they endure however fleetingly in time. They have properties like mass and energy. Events are thought of as being located in time as well as space having properties of duration and succession. So we employ temporal landmarks to orient ourselves in time, just as we employ spatial landmarks for spatial orientation. So spatial landmarks might be the table, the room, Beijing. And temporal landmarks are expressions such as today, yesterday, day, the 11th of April, my birthday, and so on. And of course, there are temporal duration words, time interval nouns, uh, such as seconds, minutes, hours, and words for seasons like summer and winter. And of course, adjectives like and short for duration. Very often, we use in many languages, spatial metaphors for temporal relations. We say things like, my birthday is coming up, or I am coming up to my birthday. Both of these we call passage metaphors because they are about the passage of metaphor. 
there have been different conceptual schemas proposed to, uh, as being the way that we organize space-time metaphor. Uh, and uh, here is the most commonly used one, uh, which first proposed by Herb Clark. Uh, we have the experience of moving along a mental timeline towards or away from an event, often called moving ego. Uh, or we have an event moving towards or past the experiencer along the mental timeline, often called moving time uh, or sometimes moving event. In such schemas, the future is usually located in front of the experiencer, that is the case in both uh, English and East, and the past behind the experiencer. However, the converse schema is attested in Aymara, uh, uh, an Andean language, and also in ancient Greek and other languages. Uh, and then I talk about a little bit about positional time, but we don't need to go into that. Uh, we can say that front back uh, constructions such as those using uh, qian and ho in uh, Chinese are uh, usually positional time. And here is a diagrammatic representation of the moving ego and moving event schemas, okay? In one case, we have the ego, uh, which, is, which, which is the deictic center, which we call now, this moment, moving towards and perhaps past uh, the event in the future. All we have in the moving event, we have the event moving past the now of the, uh, uh, of the, the deictic center of the ego. Now, we're going to go back a little bit in history. And uh, as you know, um, you know that the first person to really kind of uh, theorize, uh, well, perhaps not the first, but uh, the classical science of uh, space and time, uh, the classical physics was elaborated by Isaac Newton. And this is what he said about time, okay? He said, absolute true and mathematical time in and of itself and of its own nature without reference to anything external flows uniformly and by another name is called duration. Relative apparent and common time is any sensible and external measure, precise or imprecise, of duration by means of motion. Such a measure, for example, an hour, a day, a month, a year, is commonly used instead of true time. Now, there's two things that, well, three things that we can say about this, really. The first is that Newton believed that time was a dimension in itself, something which was metaphysically real, and that we could only measure imperfectly by looking at the motion of the heavenly bodies, okay? Uh, the second thing is that in, or in order to uh, explain this notion of absolute true and mathematical time, he had to make use of a metaphor, a passage metaphor uh, of the flow or passage of time, okay? And that raises the question about, can we think about time at all independently of space? It seems quite difficult for many of us to think about time without using such spatial metaphors. But does this mean that Newtonian time, this absolute time, is a kind of cognitive universal? Well, some cognitive scientists do think so. And here is, uh, 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 here is a, a quote from a, an article in uh, Behavioral and Brain Sciences from, uh, actually from 2020, I think. They say, Temporal reasoning operates with a four-dimensional picture of reality. In other words, the Cartesian coordinates uh, uh, plus time, which is exactly the way that Newton thought about it, on which everything that happens can be described by giving its location and the time at which it happens. We assume that our description of this naive theory of time captures basic and universal features of human thinking about time. And this includes a notion of time as linear. Linearity is a universally basic feature. That's what they say. And they're wrong. That's what we're going to tell you. 
It's not a universally basic feature. Uh, but there is, I mean, people have challenged this notion of a kind of universal linear flow of time. Uh, first of all, we have, of course, which we're not going to go into, but we have to refer to, we have the theory of the general theory of relativity as put forward by Albert Einstein. And Einstein had a friend, uh, Minkowski, uh, who was a mathematician, and indeed he was a teacher of Einstein. Uh, and he, he, was, he was really kind of ally of Einstein in putting forward the theory of relativity. And this is what Min Minkowski said originally in 1908. Henceforth, space by itself and time by itself are doomed to fade away into mere shadows. And only a kind of union of the two will preserve an independent reality. And that was, of course, space-time, the space-time continuum. And then there was this other guy who you all know about, Benjamin Lee Wharf. And he, as you probably know, he did he based his ideas on his research uh, with the Hopi people of uh, New Mexico, uh, a Pueblo Indian community. Um, and he said, uh, he said the Hopi speaker has no general notion or intuition of time as a smooth flowing continuum in which everything in the universe proceeds at an equal rate out of a future through a present into a past, or in which to reverse the picture, the observer is being carried in the stream of duration, continuously away from a past and into a future. Okay, so he denies that the Hopi people have either a moving time or a moving ego schema. He says they just don't, they just don't think like that, okay? And of course he was basing himself on linguistic data. Okay, but was 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 he right? Okay, because if he's right, then the notion that uh, uh, that that uh, uh, you know that the notion that linear time is universal has to be wrong. And we're just going to talk about uh, about this notion of absolute time. Uh, and its relationship to what we call metric time intervals. Metric time intervals, uh, such as clock time and calendar time, are those whose boundaries are constituted by the segmentation of a conceptual domain of time as an abstract and measurable entity, what we call time as such, which is more or less equivalent to Newton's idea of absolute time. Examples of metric time intervals are hours and weeks. And although metric time intervals are based upon natural astronomical cycles of events, they are conventional and their duration is determined by division and counting in a number system. And that's why uh, much of the current work that we are doing, and in particular Vera is about to go off and do field work on this, uh, is on the relationship between time and number, a very fundamental question. So metric time systems like calendars and clocks can be considered as instruments dividing the imaginary substance of time as such into quantitative units. Calendric and clock systems have a recursive structure in which different time interval units are embedded within each other. So 60 minutes in an hour, 60 seconds in a minute. And metric time involves linear or cyclic mental timelines, and crucially, it depends upon new, uh, number systems. Okay, now I'm going to give you some, uh, uh, some sort of examples of calendars. Uh, here are two Chinese calendar representations, one of which, of course, uh, uh, is uh, the Chinese zodiac, uh, the other of which is, uh, you know, a monthly calendar. Uh, and here is a, a, um, a European uh, clock, which has the same cyclical structure of time. I'm not going to explain this in detail. And here, moving away from Asia and Europe, uh, here is uh, a Pacha Kipu. Uh, actually, it's a Kipu. Kipu was a, 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 a knotted string. 
uh, very elaborate and with kind of uh, uh, segments of other strings which depended upon the main line of the string. And it was used for quantifying many things, including uh, taxes due to the uh, uh, Inca ruler, including uh, spatial dimensions like uh, the size of a plot of land, but also for uh, for uh, measuring, for, for representing the Inca calendar. And by the way, uh, this kipu, which is called the Pasha kipu, uh, you should know that the Inca term, uh, and indeed Aymara term, Pacha, means uh, Mother Earth and space and time. Here is much older uh, apparent uh, possible temporal representations. Uh, which archaeologists have discovered in Africa as long ago as 40,000 years. And it has been hypothesized that the marks on these bones uh, represent uh, time intervals, perhaps days. Perhaps they're something which, uh, uh, which women use to uh, follow their uh, menstrual cycles. We don't know. All of this has given rise to a fundamental proposal in cognitive uh, linguistics, okay, which is that space-time metaphor is universal. We call this the universal mapping hypothesis, and it is expressed uh, by our uh, very well-known colleagues, uh, the late, uh, sadly no longer with us, Gilles Fauconnier and Mark Turner, uh, writing in 2008 said, Time as space is a deep metaphor for all human beings. It is common across cultures, psychologically real, productive, and profoundly entrenched in thought and language. Okay, well, are they right about that? We will argue that in fact, they're not right. Uh, by the way, uh, we do agree that the capacity for mapping space onto time and time onto space is something that is cognitively present in all human beings. But whether it uh, actually um, uh, manifests itself in, in cultural and linguistic conceptualizations uh, is dependent upon, upon culture. Okay, that's our basic idea. So now, we have researched time concepts in Amazonian languages for more than 20 years, asking these questions. What is the role of culture and language in how people understand and represent time? What kind of systems of temporal concepts do indigenous Brazilian communities employ? Do their languages show evidence of spatialized time, like spatial metaphors? And what kind of metaphors do they use for talking about temporal relations? And it is at this point that I hand over uh, to, uh, to Vera, who will take you further into our journey of exploration into Amazonian time. Okay, so can you see me? Because <laughs> we are sharing the same screen here. So, well, yeah, oops. Yeah, so yeah, can you see me? Yeah, because I don't, have, yeah, I don't have the, the view of a uh, spectator. So, yeah. So considering these questions, yeah, uh, our team, which is here, uh, we have been investigating these four language, really. Yeah, uh, if you read the, uh, the paper of 2011, we have fed to Amandawa people which is uh, now, yes, in circle of 150 people, they live in the state of Hondonia. The language they speak is called Tupi Kawahib, which is the biggest branch of language in Brazil, right? And then in the, mesen li and the same line of the same Tupi language, we have the Kamayura people, yeah? Uh, now is more, a little bit more, 467 people. And they live in the Upper Xingu, uh, which is another state of Brazil uh, called Mato Grosso. And, and then we have another isolate language, which is also Tupi, of the Tupi Guarani family, because it's the biggest family in the whole part of Brazil and close by Brazil, the neighboring Brazil. And they are now 350 people also live in the Xingu area. 
uh, and they speak also Kamayura and other languages, right? And then also we have been work with Hachakuin language, more known as a Pan family, and they have a, a population and seven more than seven thousand people, and they live in another state of Brazil, close to Peru, Bolivia, yeah, and they have uh, and they state called uh, Acre, right? So they are distributed in this area. So I have been working with these four communities and four culture for many years, right? So to locate you and my country, yeah, here is Brazil, is as big as China, we used to say. <laughs> yeah, when I was a child, we used to say, let's go to China. You have to make a hole in the earth and the other side is China. So uh, here is this, several states of Brazil and the uh, um, research here, Huniquin, yeah, and the board of Peru. And then Rondonia is the Amandawa. And Mato Grosso, yeah, is here. And here is the Xingu National Park. And here they have around about 45 uh, communities with different language live in this area. Um, so this the main area I concentrate have been concentrate our research for many years. So methodology. So what do I do we use to do our research? So we have used a structure elicitation interview, and we have used elicitation task based on visual or no linguistic stimuli. And I'm, anthropo I'm an anthropologist, right? So I use as ethnographic main thing of my description. Uh, and for example, uh, investigating the social scheme in Amandawa, uh, as, as you already read it, the 2011 paper, and then we have here a participant with our colleagues, and what they are doing here is a is elicitation non-linguistic uh, visual elicitation. And the participants are really explaining how the season is organized in, this, in his culture. So we use a, a, a paper plate to do that. So these are type of we call methodology to explain how time uh, and space are related to each other, yeah, and how they divide the seasons on this in his culture. So basically he was, he was teaching us how they do that. So here another example, I use photos of a different aspect of the, the native life where they do that. For example, here we have a, a processing photo of um, uh, how to process flour. Uh, from cassava, from the plantation to the processing of the flour. So what we ask for the participant to organize that in order, order of event. So uh, the process is together with the plant or the plant come first and then they grow and then you collect them and then you take out and then you process that and you make the flour. So if we do that in English, probably they will put in order and then align to do that. But here you can see there are different ways to explain how this process is done. Yeah, and then you can see different shape. It can be a line, can be vertical, can be this square, it can be that one. And, and that's the way we can identify. There is no specific line for time, for time uh, is scheme in, that, in these cultures. So that's what we call manjoka task. Manjoka is cassava. Many people know in English as a cassava. Uh, uh, and that is a one a non-linguistic uh, elicitation task. So as anthropologists, right, I live in and I go to the village in different may, uh, means of transport. And, and this time I was in this boat for seven days. Uh, the plan was to be here for two days. In the end, we stayed there for more than that. And we decided to do our work and a boat, 
So I do research inside the boat <laughs> as well. So here I really start to understand what event thing, event based time mean, meant and why I didn't understand before because I was completely um, uh, overwhelmed with my model of thinking uh, as a clock time and uh, uh, if, as a non-event based time person. So in this moment, I really understood what event-based time mean. Um, so as a result of that, we have time in Amandawa, Huni, Queen, Kamaurai, and Aoichi culture is organized in terms of event-based time intervals and the following domains. Wow, it's not only these domains of uh, aspect of life, but this one is one way I managed to map that and to show easily how these things work, right? So that's why we identified these three domains to explain that. There's more, but this one is just to explain how this work. So life stage, parts of the day and night and seasons, because this, they are one of the biggest ways we as a human being organize ourselves, yeah? As a social uh, uh, person. So these intervals are index, indexically marked by specific events. For example, a position of the star, environmental happenings, board change, puberty, and old age. So all these, these domains has this indexicalization to mark and to um, nominalize or reference to time. Yeah, I'll explain how this works. So metaphors for time here are not based on spatial concepts, right? And you understand what I meant later. So life stage, for example, in Amazonian people have, have words for different life stage or stages of life. For example, uh, I can be in the hot fire stage. If I'm a boy, I can be in the keen eye or voice break stage for a young person, or it's more like we are, my husband and I, we are getting older, so we are very wrinkled time of our life. So we are very old person, <laughs> not really, <laughs> but we get there. So the life stage is a stage in this, in this conceptualization of life, right? For so life for them on this stage, so the life stage is a stage in a continual process. Remember, it's a continual process, not a point in a line. It's a continual process of learning and acquiring skills. Life stage are orders and category of social life, not a point on a lifeline, for example. Yeah. So the important how skills you acquire and how you learn that and how good you are in order to become part of this, this stage, which I show you how this work. For example, Huni Queen, yeah, you, you are child and then you have a specific name for that. And like the example I gave to you, Tipax mean hot fire. So in that time, the girl is in the stage, right? To be a woman. What do you mean to be a woman? You have, you go to married, you go to, to have a husband and you go to build a family and you go to have a responsibility as a household, not more as a child. So they have a creator expectation who will define you in that phase, right? So, and this time, for example, this the first time the girl was bleeding, yeah? The menstruation come. So what she will do, she go to be recluse, depend of the community that she stay there for a year, recluser. What she is doing there is not because she's hide off everybody. No, she's learning to be a woman. She's learning to be uh, what that means to be a woman, to be a responsibility, to have a family, and to have uh, fulfilled the, what the society expects from you in that stage of life. So that's why they stay isolated to do that. The boys as well, the same, when they, they are in the keen eye period, for example, Huni Queen, so they are learning 
they have a period of reclusion as well. They go to have a lot of ritual of a passage. And also they are learning that time. They have to be, to be a keen eye, which means you have expert, right? And you can kill, you can be a good hunter. Yeah, that's the time you are hunter. You only go to merit if you are good and really in this phase of a keen eye. So that's, that system is, can see in all these four cultures, right? And here, when you are eco, eco ocean, yeah, or ikimest, uh, uh for men, you are very old. You are really rink and um, you are kind of a, in many cultures, uh, in a wise, wise phase of your life. So you doesn't expect you go to hunt. Yeah, and they don't expect you go to marry them anymore or just look after your grandchild. So each phase of their life has a responsibility, has a learning process to be part of that. In our case, we just become, my birthday is next month, but I don't say the number, but you just become that number, right? So we don't have much expectation in that sense when you wind these phases. So part of the day is the same. So event-based time consists of time intervals that are not measured as such, right? But index to happenings. How this work? These happenings can be events or events that occur in the natural environment, like the level of the river the heat and position of the sun, the social activities, moon and stars. These happenings index and define the parts of the day and night and the parts of the dry and rain seasons. These happening index enable the community to know when to plant and harvest, when to celebrate festivals in another part of their lives. So we have the calendar to divide ourselves, right? We wake up in the morning and already do our planning. So during the year in English culture, we do our planning for the whole year, where we go to travel, what we go to work, and when we go to talk, when you go to visit people. So, but we are only look to the calendars and the clock for doing that. So for this community, they use all these indexicalization to decide what they go to do, right? So so linguistically, here, a representation how they use. So in the first part of the morning, the sunlight is the most thing, and it's obvious because the light, the dark gone, and the light starts. So what we go to do when the light starts? So, and then they divide that in different part of the day, right? They have different part of the morning for different things, right? So, and then, then after you wake up, have your breakfast or things, you organize yourself, you go to work in the field. So these also become indexicalization for, for doing things. And then because they index something, you're doing something, it's become a time relation, right? So activities is one index. And then you have the position of the sun. So here you have the sunlight. It's not dawn anymore. It's start light. The sun didn't burn yet. But here, the sun is really high up, right? And it's strong. If you go to Amazonia, I don't know, in other countries is the same, but in Amazonia and the, the tropical forest, the sun is heat up, right? So depend of the position of the sun, there's also be divide what you are able to do or not able to do, and then become a time reference as well. But when the sun gone, is another part of your activity organization of the day, and the night. So you also have activity and then you go to sleep eventually. So, so sun is uh, linguistically in every single uh, uh, archive or inventory for index time on this language. An absence of the light of the sunlight, specifically of the sunlight as well. So in another language, OHE as well, you can see they hold this, uh, the position of the sun, the sunlight, the activities, and the moon, position of the moon, the shape of the moon is all go to indexicalize time. Yeah. 
And then you can see in Kamayura as well. And then we can see in Kamayura, one other things also indexicalized is the absence of noise, right? Which I call is, is an activity, but is the absence of the activity. So if you live in the forest, in the tropical forest, it's very noisy, right? But believe it or not, sometime of the night, everything go to sleep. And when they go to sleep, right? And that's the time these also become a reference, temporal reference for what you go to do. You go to sleep too. <laughs> it's better to sleep at that time. It's so nice, right? So to divide seasons is important to say in tropical forests, we have only two seasons. Yeah, either it's rain or it's too hot, right? So for the, for, for, for the communities who live in this area, they they know that and they know and but for us you could say oh it's hot or or cold yeah or is rain and not rain so but these become temporal marks when you divide that in different parts of your life and then they have very different ways to do that right and that, and then you can see the cool breeze and water is elements or, or happening in the environment will go to index that in, in, on this community, in Aoichi, Kamaura, and Hunikui. And also the position of the sun, yeah, you can see Kwarupe, Kwarip, the Kwa here in Waichi and Tupi is word for sun. And for the language in, in Hunikui, Bar is the also is the sun the word for sun. So the sun become the main central thing for time indexicalization here. And here you de define what you to go to plant, what you go to have, when you go to have. So it's become a calendarical thing in that sense, right? Because you organize yourself socially to do things in that moment disappear. And then linguistically, yeah, uh, uh, you can see the proof here in different language, the words refer to water, yeah, to breeze, to the sun, to sun, yeah, to the rain, but U is water, mean is a, um, is a, uh, anything related to water, uh, and Ru, U, to sun, mean is because of the breeze also have water, but that you feel, you have a feeling to cool your body. So that's also become part of the, the season intervals indexicalization. So, but not only that, all the environment is become a big indexicalization for these people in Amazonia time, for the sun, moon, and stars. Yet the sun, the moon, and the stars are visible to all humans in beings, right? But they are basic to the navigation by all human groups of space and event-based time. For example, in Amazonian society, like in all other societies, the sun, the moon, and the stars have special, special meanings. Yeah, they normally they are beings as well as also in decks. They are expressed in the myth and legends and as well regulate human activities as indexicalization of time. So for example, one good example for that, for example, the moon is indexical marker for event-based time intervals, yeah? And a part of the day, for example, tattoo puku is late on the night, it's kind of divide the night in terms of time. The moon shape, or phase of the moon, also indexicalize the menstrual cycle of a woman, right? Each woman has their own moon shape. For example, in our society, we have our calendar, right? So you know when we go to menstruate, depend of you, you do your mark on the calendar. So in this community, they don't use the numerical calendar, but they use the moon as a calendar to mark that. How would they do that, right? When I am a hot fire girl, right? My, 
get my menstruation, my first thing to do is to look up to the sky. When I see the sky, I look to the moon. Where is the moon? So I, I get that shape of the moon. And from now on, that shape of the moon will be my index, right? So every month, I look to the, the sky and I'll see that moon shape and they'll indexicalize my menstrual cycle, right? So I will learn uh, how to, to control and when I go to be pregnant, if I don't, don't miss weight and then my cycle time. So, so every new moon, the men and women ask also in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, beliefs, yeah? And uh, 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 the moon is incorporated in cultural practice too. So every new moon, for example, the men and women ask the moon to give health to the children and protect them from illness and crying. The moon is also asked to take away people, ugliness, laziness, anger, and bad dreams and to suppress gossip about them, right? And I also, for example, I, where I grew up and a big moon or a red moon is, was a, um, a big problem. When we had a big moon, we have to bang the, the pan because to get the ugliness of our, and the bad, bad eyes of our body. I used to do that when I was a child. So uh, the moon index subsistence uh, activity in Huni Queen, for example, Ushinia and Binaki, the moon is growing. The community will plant the crops, adverbs, and awechi. Yeah, and awechi and Kamaira, uh, the moon, yeah, and the moon last night signified that there are plenty of fish. So this time of a fish. So everything relates to the environment where you, when you go to do things. So uh, the stars as well, the names of the stars and appearance of the star constellation also index event-based intervals. Yeah, here they are, the name of the constellation. they very, very nice. I don't know if in your side of the world you see the same constellation, but in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, we can see Junungpa, uh, Ekutat, Atisingayu, Tukanava, Tukana, and the Ook, Taurit, Inua, and Tuvet. That's Akamayura constellation. For example, here, right? If I ask you how many stars you can see here, you probably go to say nine, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or eight, no. So, but in the community who, I, when I ask, they will say this constellation is composed by three stars. And then if you check on the draw, they did, everything is related to three star. yeah? Here, every corner you go, they make a shape of three stars. So you can see that go uh, in any composition of the constellation and drawing of the constellation. These are my next research. I'm going next this month to, to feel to see the relationship by number and time. Okay, event-based time, society and time reckoning. Uh, for example, Amandawa, Oechi, Huni Queen, and Kamaiura are all society in which life is organized and regulated by system of event-based time concepts. The similarity between the event-based time system of these geographically and linguistically diverse communities suggests that the existence of an uh, Amazonian cultural area. So this is one a hypothesis. We have been uh, kind of try to following up that and I hope by the end of my next research, we can really confirm such a thing. So event-based time is space of time keeping this com community in this society. But do they have ways of quantify time? Do they use artifact-based time reckoning practice? Hmm, it's a good question. Yeah, they do, right? So in Kamayora and Awechi, they use this cognitive artifact here. So it's a it's a, 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 a knot on the string. So this is a string. And here, Tamahet is telling me how they he would go to a fishing 
expedition. And each knot of that represent one day of the expedition. How this work? Normally he would do two, two of this string, one gift to the, the family and another one he bring to him. So every time of the end of the day, he untied a knot. So by the end of untying the knot, he has to come back. If he doesn't come back, so the family knows some things go to happen with him and they need to find out what's happened, right? So it is a way of uh, uh, reckoning time in that sense. So that's why we call cognitive artifact. So in relation to time, they also, uh, because the education, because they attack with our, our, our in non-indigenous communities, so these create a hybrid calendars, right? It's the true system. Our, our system ways, like metrical system, together with event-based system, and that breed them together, and they create this beautiful, I think it's amazing, calendars. So you can search hybrid calendars or, or cultural calendars and Google, they will show you many, many. It seems to be very common and not in South America, but in Australia and other communities use the system. For example, November is a calendar, metrical calendar, right? So the sun time is a base time. So that's what we call uh, uh, metric, uh, hybrid calendars. So metaphors for time. Remember that we found that the Amandawa did not use a spatial metaphor for time, and there was no evidence of the linearization of time or mental timeline. We found the same absence of a spatial metaphor for time in the Awechi, Huniqui, and Kamara community. They don't use moving ego or move time metaphors. Does this mean they, they are not no metaphor for time. That would be strange because after all, time is an abstract domain. So they do have metaphor for time. However, for the Huniqui, the past is located in the heart. Yeah, the future is located in the head and the future is in the mind. So it's not in the front. For us, it's in the front, right? And or in the past in the back. For this community, its heart and mind is the location of time. So it's embodied. And in our Chi the past, uh, the past is located in the eyes. So if I did something and it's no longer happen anymore, so where I store these ideas, so normally I say, oh, I left my past behind, right? In English and Portuguese as well, which is my mother language, we would say that in Kamaura and Awechi, if I want to say that, I, I have to say the past is in my eyes. Yeah, the past and sense in link with memories and memories can be seen in the mind of I, right? So the future is not far ahead in my front, not behind like in another country, uh, another cultures have been found, but is in front of, of my eyes. So I have my past here in and my future is in front of my eyes. It's not far away. I can see it. If I can't see it, there is no future, right? So it's mainly the, the, the indexical is, is memory and imagination and also embodiment of in your body. So they are not moving anywhere. They are located in your body. So cultural past and temporal metaphor, metaphor for partners and futurity of events are based upon embodied cognitive process, not upon a specialization of timeline, as you could see the location of time before. The embodiment of cognitive process are those involving anticipation and memory, enable mental time travel. The past is in my eyes, which you come out Compared with English, we could say understanding is seeing. We have that metaphor in English. So in our overall, in our research, uh, the key finds are, in terms of universality, we, we found that linguistically represented event-based time intervals can be considered to be universal in all human cultures. So if we want to talk about universality, we should talk about event-based time because you can find that everywhere. 
right? In English, we can say, let's go to meet in the, uh, the tea time, right? Or lunch time. And I'm sure that in another language and culture does that too. So reference to past and future events in relation to the present time is a transcultural linguistic universal. Yeah, every language has have datic time or D time. So the sequence ordering of detached event based time intervals is a transcultural linguistic universal. So every culture would have a sequential time when event have after and after after each other. So you have this sequence, what we call as time. So I agree with that, it's universal. However, the difference, metrical time is not a transcultural universal. So not everybody do metaphor and metrical time. The detached representation of temporal dimension itself, time as such, is not a transcultural universal either, because this I can't find any of these four cultures. The mental timeline, everybody claim is universal, is not a transcultural universal, is a cultural model, right? An event-based time is reckoning or tracking using these cognitive artifacts that vary between cultures, right? So, and system, systematic space-time metaphor is a, a transcultural, is not, trans, is not cultural universal either, right? So, the world is made of things, like Chris already said, um yeah all all known human society have ways of think about and talk about events or events and the temporal relation between events so when events happen after each other as time events is it? okay uh chris kick, kick, kick me here he said he can take over now so there we are <laughs> okay well I meant you to finish off this slide. Oh. <laughs> anyway, it doesn't matter because it's a joint uh, presentation, but we're just going back uh, to Carlo, the quotation from uh, Carlo Rovelli, the physicist, that the world is made of events, not things. Uh, yes, and indeed, uh, there are a lot of universals, right? Um, you know, there is no society which doesn't have time or concepts of time. Every society has concepts of time. Every society has ways of thinking and talking about events and the relations between events. Like Vera said, what comes first, what comes next, uh, whether it was in the past or in the future, yeah. even if they don't have words for past and future, even if they don't have, like in Chinese, verbal tense. There are always ways of doing that. Our conclusion is that events and event structure are actually the fundamental building blocks of human conceptualization. And think about this. This is absolutely consistent uh, with everything that we know from cognitive linguistics as well. Think of uh, uh, Talmud's theory of uh, you know, uh, different uh, uh, force dynamics and so on. And so we repeat here, Carlo Rovelli, we can think of the world as being made up of things, of substances, of entities of something that is, or we can think of it as being made up of events, of happenings, of processes, of something or some things that occur, okay, which is the event view. So we say it's really time to rethink space and time in cognition and language. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, so, yeah. We've said, yeah. and go back. We've said that uh, events and event structure are the fundamental bu building blocks. So then we ask the question, why do philosophical and psychological theories, especially of Western psychologists and Western philosophers, continue to view objects as being more fundamental than events and to re reify events, representing them as things in time or things ordered on a line? So we're coming to our conclusion now. Uh, and uh, I just want to refer to uh, a very famous uh, linguist uh, and anthropologist, uh, Franz Boas, uh, who uh, actually can claim to be one of the 
fundamental fathers of modern linguistics. Uh, Franz Boas, a hundred years ago, uh, wrote this. He wrote, a purely linguistic inquiry is part and parcel of a thorough investigation of the psychology of the peoples of the world. And we believe that, uh, that, 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 that the investigation of language gives us a window, uh, not just into the mind uh, universally, but also uh, differences between different cultures in, the, in, in their worldviews and also their conceptualizations of the world. And we say here, standing on the feet of giants, right? Which is uh, an expression that is often used about uh, Newtonian uh, physics. So we are trying to suggest that we need to move towards what we call a post-Warfian theory of language, culture, and thought. So in, so in this post-Warfian approach, okay, which is different, by the way, from the uh, neo-Warfian approach, which is uh, represented by um, Steve Levinson and, and his group. In our post-Warfian theory, we say the following. Languages both express and entrench cultural differences. They do not determine them, okay? Languages do not determine differences in the way in which we think. Mm -hmm. And what one simple thing that we can say is that in all the cultures that we've been talking about, Amazonian cultures, uh, the majority of people actually speak Portuguese as well. Yeah. And they're perfectly able to understand calendar systems. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able, able to produce these hybrid artifacts, hybrid calendars, you know? So we're not entrapped by our languages, but languages do entrench cultural differences. Secondly, human cognition is based not just upon the brain, uh, it's based upon extended embodiment, something that uh, we have written about uh, at some length uh, in, in theoretical papers that I have published, for example, on the role of, uh, on language as an artifact and its relationship with other artifacts, okay? So symbolic cognitive artifacts play a fundamental role in extended embodiment. And then thirdly, the idea that cognitive domains, what you know, like space and time and so on, are direct expressions of neural structure, function and process is mistaken. There is no direct mapping between like, uh, uh, the linear linearization of the mental timeline and something in the brain. This is a, a complete, yeah. it's false, simply false. And now uh, the final thing is much more speculative, okay? Uh, and uh, it relates to the way in which we actually cut the world up, the ontology of, of being, right? The, the theories of being that different cultures have. Um, and, and most of our theories, okay, uh, and this was indeed what Worf was trying to say and challenge, okay? Most of our theories in philosophy, psychology, and so on, and even linguistics uh, are based upon a Western worldview, going back all the way to the Greeks and to Aristotle, in which you have objects which exist in space and in time, uh, and these are primary, and notions like event and action are secondary, okay? Now, we have the hypothesis uh, following the research that we have conducted into Amazonian concepts of time, that actually Amazonian ontology is different. Uh, if events are fundamental, and in particular, and we don't have time to explain this in, in detail because that partly depends upon the, uh, the analysis of the grammar as well of these languages, okay, that uh, events are fundamental, and in particular, the completion of events is really fundamental. You know, so like uh, the use of evidential, uh, you know, uh, uh, have you seen something? Have you witnessed it? And if, can you commit yourself to actually completing uh, some kind of uh, event, right? Uh, and, uh, and also uh, another very fundamental notion in Amazonian philosophy, if you like, is state of being, okay? All beings can go through different states. They can transition from one state to another state. And this is a fundamental, uh, you know, um, um, and, and, and because of that, uh, th there are really very different uh, worldviews of Amazonian people and, uh, 
uh, and, and Western cultures about these states of being because there are many more beings in the world than there are Western culture, okay? And they can their states, okay? Also have, you know, after... Uh, after, after talking with... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Chris, you can go on. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay, so we, we, we think that the Chinese ontology, cultural ontology, is also different from the Western one. Uh, also, uh, process is very imp important uh, in, Chinese, uh, uh, in, in, in Chinese cultural models. Uh, it, it's much more processual than object-oriented. And also the completion of processes is important. Uh, and also, but also in, Ch in Chinese... Uh, mm, uh, in 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 Chinese uh, worldview, it seems to us, and of course this is something that we give to you as a as a just as a hypothesis, uh, is that you know the the, the basic uh, notion of state of being is divide is is a dualism of existence and non-existence in in uh, Chinese philosophy. So this is uh, this is our conclusion really. This is our mm -hmm. groping towards a post-Warfian. Uh, theory of language, culture, and thought, and I'm trying to get onto the next slide. Get rid of. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So this is our, I mean, our more specific conclusion. I'm going to hand back to Vera. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. So anyway, so concepts of time vary between and within language because this concept is strongly linked toward views and cultural practice. I hope you are now agree with me, agree with us. Social practice and cognitive artifacts are influential and determine the source domain that underline cult metaphor for time not only uh, space, right? So here are some photos of the community uh, we work with. And here our big team, are we not possible to do that without the native speakers who are these expert knowledge holders uh, of what I'm saying today, right? They are the expert. So they all have, they also are researchers, yeah? And they also hold a PhD in linguistics. And I'm an honor to work with them. And then together we develop a project called VeraSinha.com, which called Quara, which I bring uh, some activism to the work I do. And I help the community promote. If you click that, have a look. Uh, I, uh, we do publish a lot of stuff a lot of material and their language they 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 do and many other things we we support as a project with my my collaborators and colleagues and brothers and sisters yeah and here our big team as always chris and vani which is always in this team forever uh and then we have the collaboration as well of pt edford from loon and then we worked together in 2011 with Jörg Zinken, now in Manhattan University in German, right? So if you want to find more information about everything, we have a video time and culture. I did that. <laughs> okay, I had a lot of help with so many people, but this is basically my first documentary. Second documentary.